Well, this morning I want us to begin in Psalm 139 and uh, verses 14 and 15. If you want to find your way there, feel free to do that. Psalm 139 verses 14 and 15 are also on your screen. It says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. In other words, I marvel, I'm amazed when I look at what you have created, what you've done. And that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. That's a, a reference to the womb. In the womb, that little, when we were just physically just an embryo, God knew what was going on and he made us. It's astounding to look at uh, how fast and how well everything is made and formed in the, in the womb. Dawkins, Dawkins uh, wrote a book called The Blind Watchmaker and there he wrote, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. And then he proceeds to argue that they were not. Richard Dawkins, of course, a well-known Darwinist, Darwin uh, worshiper, if we could put it that way. This is the year of Darwin, they tell us. Uh, I'd say it's the year of our Lord, always has been, every year is. But Dawkins uh, has often proclaimed the no design, therefore no designer line. But Ben Stein in his documentary expelled asked him what do you think is the possibility that intelligent design might turn out to be the answer to some issues in genetics or evolution and Dawkins response was well it could be that at some earlier time somewhere in the universe a civilization evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this planet And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer, end quote. Now for Dawkins, that's quite a concession to to, to at least go that far. But even if Dawkins were to accept the evidence of a signature of some sort of designer, he wouldn't allow that to be the God of the Bible in his thinking. He's very firm. He said nothing like that. Uh, but, But Stein later said, so Professor Dawkins was not against intelligent design, just certain types of designers such as God. Well, we know God is the designer. This verse is very clear. God made us in a wonderful way and he's not hidden his handiwork from us. Romans chapter one tells us he has spoken through the prophets later on through his son, his divine son, Uh, by whom and for whom all things were made according to John 1 and Colossians 1 he came to die in our place so that all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation should not perish but have everlasting life his word can be trusted not just in matters of morality and salvation but also in matters regarding the history of the universe despite much heralded year of Darwin proclamations And so what I want us to do now is to look once again at two facets. Uh, First off today, we're going to look at vestigial organs. Vestigial organs are supposed to be leftovers from man's evolutionary past that no longer have a, a function or a purpose. For example, the human coccyx called the tailbone is supposed to be left over from when man was an ape and swung from trees. See that little tail at the bottom there? Well, it's not a tail, but it kind of looks like one, so it's been called a tailbone, which is just evolution. That's all it is. It's not a tailbone. Never had anything to do with a tailbone. We'll prove that a little bit later today. But still today, none, uh, you know, so well-esteemed Uh, then the Encyclopedia Britannica still lists it as a vestigial organ and talks about the the tailbone, the coccyx. Charles Darwin used this myth as proof of his theory. And in addition to the coccyx, he listed 
wisdom teeth, appendix, and body hair. Robert Wiedersheim, a Darwinist to Germany, enlarged the list. He came up with 180 vestigial organs. And he added to those the pineal gland, the pituitary gland, the tonsils, as well as the thymus. Wiedersheim said, man is a veritable walking museum of antiquities. He continues to inherit them, though he no longer has any use for them. Well, I hope by the end of today that you would be able to say if Vedersheim is right and we actually don't need all these things, we'd be in, well, we're going to show that he's wrong and that we do need these things. And if we didn't have them, we would be in an awful mess. They, they greatly help us. His statements were used as evidence, though, in the Scopes trial of Tennessee in 1925, a turning point in the world, in, in Western democracy, a turning point in thinking through the Scopes trial. It was through this time frame and through this trial that they took uh, creation out of teaching in state schools. Up until this time, you'd go to school and you'd hear about creation. But from this point on, evolution. And some of us, that's all we've ever known. Well, most of us, that's all we've ever known. And we might have thought that's how it always was. No, evolution uh, has only been taught uh, for a hundred years in, in, uh, in our state schools. The concept was so popular as an evolutionary icon that Ernst Haeckel gave it the name of Desteleology, or the science of rudimentary organs. Vestigial organs are still widely used as proof for evolution, and here are some textbooks in uh, Nepal that are, are still teaching it. You can see um, the, one of the pages of it. Well, vestigial organs, let's look at two things about it here. First off, they do not prove evolution happened. They assume evolution happened. And secondly, the idea of vestigial organs was based on ignorance. They do have important functions. So first off, they don't prove but assume evolution. Vestigial organs are used as evidence for evolution, but even if there are organs that have no known function, this does not prove that evolution happened. Like his other so-called proofs, Darwin first assumed that evolution is true and then interpreted the evidence on this assumption. Apart from the assumption that evolution has happened, there is no evidence that organs such as the coccyx are leftovers. What it is is circular reasoning. It's not science. It is just circular reasoning. Because we assume evolution is the case, well, therefore, we're going to use this and we're going to point to this as, as proof. And all you have to do is Google vestigial organs and you'll see that is actually the case that over and over they will say uh, that vestigial organs are proof for evolution. But here's where I want to spend a little more time. The idea of vestigial organs was based on ignorance. As man's understanding of the human body has increased since the time of Darwin, we have learned that the so-called vestigial organs have important purposes. Jerry Bergman, doctorate in human biology, stated in his book, vestigial organs are fully functional, that the number of vestigial organs had shrunk to zero by 1999. Remember, uh, Weidersham's book said 180 vestigial organs. He expands this list, says there's so many of them. Bergman says, no, actually, there's none, not a one. And we're going to look at just some of those as we go through this, this morning. We're not going to uh, have time to be detailed about all of the things that are used, but I think this will be enough to help. Jonathan Sephardi, doctorate in physical chemistry and also a chess champion, refutes the myth of vestigial organs in his book, By Design. The first one let's look at is tonsils. The tonsils are important for the growth of the immune system. They help establish the body's defense capabilities by producing antibodies. Once these develop, the tonsils shrink to a smaller size in adults. Remember, uh, maybe, maybe you had this done or maybe you heard uh, it was a very normal thing back, I guess in the 40s, 50s, 60s, they would just pull out your tonsils uh, quite rapidly, quite quickly in, in certain parts of the world. 
uh, when, when they became inflamed, oh, we got to get rid of them. No, no, they actually had a purpose that they had to fulfill, but those have been listed as vestigial organs. They have no function. They're just left over from our evolutionary past. No, no, that's, that's now been shown not to be the case. And then there is this nic nictitating uh, membrane, nictitating membrane on the human eye is said to be a vest vestige of the nictitating membrane that some animals have. So you look in the mirror and you see this little thing that it's uh, pointing to there and you say, what is that? What's its purpose? Well, uh, let me just start by saying as well, the Encyclopedia Britannica currently lists it as a vestigial organ. In some animals, this membrane acts like a second eyelid to clean and lubricate the eye. So, here's a nictating membrane on a masked lapwing bird. High-speed photography has caught the membrane in various stages. You see on the left, the membrane is in its resting position. And then in the center photo, the membrane is halfway across the eye and then in the right photo, the membrane is fully covering the eye. And maybe you've seen that last one and you say, oh, it looks almost like the bird has cataracts. You know, I don't know if you've ever noticed that in nature. They actually uh, it has a purpose. It's an obtaining membrane. Our designer wisely put it together. The human membrane is completely different from the animal nictating membrane. There's no evidence that it ever moved or fully covered the eye. The small membrane has a very important function. It secretes a sticky solution to collect foreign material that gets in the eye. You wake up in the morning and you, and you rub your eyes and you pull it down. There's just a little, little bit of gunk there. That's all been cleaned out for you during the night. As the eyelid moves over the moist eye, dirt is channeled to the membrane where it encrusted, it's encrusted in a sticky ball to be easily removed. Without this membrane, the human eye would be much more prone to injuries and infections. So, would you not agree then, if I've got to choose between the Encyclopedia Britannica, this is, it has no function, you don't really need it, it's vestigial organ, left over from your evolutionary past, or to say, no, my God is a wise, uh, marvelous creator, we'd be wiser to go with the second. Science backs that up as we look at it. Let's look at wisdom teeth that sometimes don't properly develop and they have to be removed. Nearly 40 years ago, I went to the dentist. I was uh, a teenager and he said, it's time for your wisdom teeth to be taken out. I said, why is that? <laughs> you know, I don't really relish the thought of having my wisdom teeth taken, why, why do I have to have them out? He said, well, they're left over from your evolutionary past. You don't need them, see. And I thought, well, until I get a better reason than that, I'm gonna leave them in. And of course, I've had a few taken out since then, but not because of any kind of vestigial organ, but for health reasons, they needed to come out. The Encyclopedia Britannica, again, lists it as a vestigial organ. Wisdom teeth are the third molars that come in there. And sometimes they don't develop properly and they do have to be removed. I think they call that an impacted wisdom tooth. Dentists have traced the problem to diet. Wisdom teeth are a problem in richer countries where the diet consists largely of soft food. So God's given them to us uh, for some of those harder foods that we need to crunch down on. But as we don't eat as much of that, maybe, um, and, and hard foods don't include Doritos and, you know, things like that. Uh, well, then, then I suppose perhaps it has an impact on impacting our wisdom teeth. But when the diet consists of foods requiring more chewing, as has been true for most of human history, the jaw is better developed, so there's more room for the teeth. Well, there's also the pina, also called auricle. It's the outer part of the ear. And as I shared with you a moment ago, Darwin called that vestigial. 
You don't need this little flappy thing on the side of your head. <clears throat> well, it's an integral and important part of the human ear we have since discovered. It amplifies, directs, and filters sound. It acts as a directional amplifier to help the ear perceive different sounds. It has very complex functions, and more is being learned all the time. I remember many years ago, uh, they learning a little bit about how speakers function and how these speakers that are on the side of the room, they are aimed uh, in a particular fashion. You don't just put them any old direction. They are aimed toward the back of the room and to be like a V to where they meet when you first walk in the room. And that's intentional. That's the way, that's the way they have to be. And it would sound very different in here if we kind of made, played around with that. Well, that's, that's how God put your ear. Aren't you glad he didn't put it the other way? has very complex functions, and we're learning more about it. Far from being vestigial, the complex structures of the pina and external ear canal are now recognized as significant components in the mechanisms that underlie the capacity of a listener to recognize and localize sounds in space. So here you are, you, you hear a sound, and reflexively you turn in the direction of that sound. That's something you don't even have to think about. But, it, but that's how God made it. All, along with that are the ear muscles. Evolutionists tell us that ear muscles are left over from animals that can move their ears. Uh, take a cat that's got the ability to wiggle their ears. And some of us, anyone in here able to move your ears around without any effort? All right, some of us can do that. That's, that's uh, not a... <laughs> some of you are practicing right now, right? <laughs> but... Um, uh, not all of us are able to do that. But the Encyclopedia Britannica says that's also left over from uh, evolution. It's vestigial. These auricular muscles. Actually, the human ear muscles are an important part of the complex facial muscle system that God built us with. The face is the only part of the body that has muscles under the skin. Ear muscles are part of the facial expression muscle group that develops from the second branchial arch, they tell us. And this amazing system allows the human face to make complex expressions to communicate your thinking and your feelings. They tell us we can make more than 20 different expressions. There are a number of ways. These are six photos just showing how to express surprise. And maybe it's not something we've ever thought much about, but there's a happy surprise. There's a sad surprise. There's a fearful surprise. And uh, there's a disgusting surprise and an angry surprise and so forth. Here are the 20 different expressions that your face can make illustrated. Very interesting how God has made it such that without saying a word, we communicate with our faces. And this is in a way that, think about it, what animal can do this? Have you ever seen a fish that can put a smile on its dial? You know, it can't do that. Uh, you, you scare a cockroach and you don't see it, you know, startle. But we can. God's made us that way. Now, I've seen cockroaches scare people and, and and we can show that all right let's talk about the appendix again sometimes an appendix has to come out uh, but we don't rip rip them out uh, routinely uh, but to call it a vestigial organ is to basically say it you don't need it why not go on in there and pull it out researchers at the duke university medical center in 2007, reported that the appendix is a storehouse for good bacteria to help digestion and to repopulate the intestine after the body flushes out bad bacteria. There's certain parts of the world where they, the intestines get flushed out quite regularly, and God has put the appendix in there uh, to be able to refill uh, our gut with healthy bacteria and, and that's at least one job of the appendix that the scientists have found. 
The myth that the appendix is a vestigial organ was exploded in a report published in 2009 in Scientific American, and it's like they go, oh, we were wrong, but they don't correct the websites that are out there. I'm showing you websites that you can go and find. I found them this week. You know, they're there, easy to find, still promoting lies, saying this is a vestigial organ, and it and this proves evolution. It, it, it establishes evolution. What they said in this report, the appendix is a storehouse of beneficial bacteria that help us digest food. Studies have shown that when the appendix is removed, there's a much greater chance of getting leukemia, Hodgkin's disease, and cancer of the colon or ovaries. I was just visiting someone this week in hospital who has Hodgkin's disease and also has had their appendix removed. Obviously, there was, would have been a good reason why that was removed, but sadly, they have had uh, health um, problems, and there's a tie there between the two. So to call this a vestigial organ is not scientific at all. In spite of such scientific findings, Biology Online currently lists the appendix as vestigial and says it has no other function. This I pulled off of Biology Online just yesterday, I guess. Ostrich wings. Let me talk about ostrich wings with you. Wings on non-flying birds like the ostrich are said to be vestigial. Biology Online currently lists not just ostrich wings, but flightless island birds like the kiwi, the penguin, uh, the in inaccessible island rails, the steamer duck, Oh, some of these other ones I haven't heard of. Cassowary, uh, dodo, which is now extinct. All, all of these, they say, well, they're flightless birds. That, that shows then, therefore, they're vestigial as far as the wings on them. Well, the truth is that every part of the ostrich points to perfect design. It is not a bird that evolved from a flying bird. It's designed for life on the land. The evolutionist assumes that it, it came from the flying bird. With its massive body and huge neck, legs, and feet, an ostrich never could have flown. A male weighs an average of 115 kilograms and stands two and a half meters high. It can't fly, but it is a magnificent runner. They tell us it's the fastest creature on two legs. The ostrich can run 70 kilometers per hour in bursts and can maintain 50 kilometers per hour for a half an hour. I don't think I could do that. <laughs> That's pretty good. Even ostrich chicks can run at more than 50 kilometers per hour. The ostrich's wings are a completely different type of wing uh, from the flying bird. The wings are used not to fly, but to regulate body temperature. The skin under the feathers is bare, and the creature expertly controls its internal temperature by covering and uncovering this skin with its wings. The ostrich uses its wings also as a rudder when it runs. <laughs> and it can make quick turns, as it's about to demonstrate, uh, using the wings as counterbalances. Now it takes off. And watch the wings. As it turns, it can make these fairly tight turns counterbalanced by the wings. Design proves the designer. This is God who has done this great work. Flying bird feathers, on the other hand, are quite different. Now, Lord willing, next week, I want us to devote an entire session just to how birds do not prove evolution. Birds uh, actually are the opposite. They're going to show a designer. But, but just a little sneak preview here. Ostrich feathers aren't flight feathers. Flight feathers have a complex interlocking hook system, which we'll show you, composed of barbs and barbules. Ostrich feathers are soft and fluffy, and they act as perfect insulation because they never were meant to fly, but to insulate. 
Consider the lack of a keel. The ostrich doesn't have a keel like flying birds. What do we mean by that? Well, the keel is the large ridge. Do you see right there in the center of the illustration is a breastbone. You'll find this on all birds. Uh, we opened up a turkey. You might open up a chicken. And you see this breastbone in there. The bird's powerful flight muscles are attached to this thing, and it keeps it, as we say, on an even keel. Without it, it could go all over. But the ostrich doesn't fly. It doesn't need a keel. Consider the bones. Flying birds have these hollow bones, whereas an ostrich doesn't. Many of an ostrich's bones are solid to provide strength for running and kicking and other functions, again, on land. The ostrich is so strong that you can ride it if you are game enough. And in some countries, they have ostrich races. We'll show you one here. And there they go. Long neck Ned made an aggressive left turn. And meanwhile, it is flightless Fred surging away to a big time easy. Easy win. Okay. <laughs> so there you go. Makes you want to go find an ostrich and ride it, doesn't it? The Bible says the female ostrich is hardened against her young ones as though they were not hers. It's true. It's the male. It's the male that God has raising the chicks, teaching them how to feed and protecting them from predators. The female is called a hen and the male is called a cock or rooster. The hen is gray colored. The cock is black. So there you go. Now you can tell the difference. Next time you see an ostrich around. The ostrich egg is 150 mil long, weighs as much as 1.3 kilograms. It's equal to 24 chicken eggs. You can see the contrast there in the photo. All right. How about vestigial legs on the whale? Thomas Huxley, remember Darwin's bulldog? He said, no doubt whales had hind legs once upon a time. Well, the only part about that that's true is the once upon a time, the fable. A very small percentage of sperm whales have vestigial leg bones, and some even have bone-supported bumps protruding from their bodies, says Prentice Hall Biology. The alleged hind legs are actually bones that are not attached to the whale's skeleton. The whale has no sign of a pelvis or any mechanism that has anything to do with vestigial legs. Hmm... Kind of throws that theory out of the water that these bones are left over from an evolutionary past, that they once walked on these things. And we're going to devote a whole session just to how whales uh, uh, are said to ha have as their ancestors a wolf. Well, there's the coccyx. It's called the tailbone because evolutionists believe it is left over from human evolution from apes. Biology Online currently lists the coccyx as vestigial. Also, I already shared with you at Encyclopedia Britannica does. They call it the remnant of a lost tail. It's that end of the spinal column. It's part of the pelvic girdle that we all have. Dr. David Menton in cell biology from, a doctorate in cell biology from Brown University uh, has studied anatomy, biology, teaches on it. He said the coccyx is a very important part of the body. It's not like a tail. The coccyx has no muscles associated with movement and no bones that are an extension of the vertebral column. The coccyx with the many muscles that attach to it is a very important part of human anatomy forming a floor for the organs in the lower part of our body. And here he is explaining that for us. Another example of a presumably useless organ, in this case a, a bone in the body, is the so-called tailbone. Uh, the idea is that our monkey-like ancestors uh, had tails swung from the trees. Uh, now, uh, since we have been apes and now humans, we, we lack this tail. And in its place is this little memory tag here uh, called the tailbone. 
Actually, the anatomical term is coccyx, and it is not a tail, and it is certainly not without function. In fact, if I were to rank the bones of the body on how important they are by how many different muscles attach from how many different directions, I would rank the tailbone up near the top. If you've ever fallen on your tailbone or your coccyx, you know it hurts. Just about any position you're in, it hurts. That's because all of these muscles pulling on this little piece of bony real estate. The whole rim of your pelvis, your hip bones, have muscles that converge on that little point of bone. These muscles uh, form what's called the pelvic diaphragm. It's a muscular bowl deep down in our pelvis and setting above it would be the bladder, the uterus, and uh, other parts of the bowel. If this muscle were not there, then because we are standing upright, uh, things would tend to herniate or, or pass uh, through uh, this floor. You can't overestimate the importance of this critical anchoring point uh, for six really major muscles of the pelvic diaphragm. To call that a vestigial organ is not science. The concept of vestigial organs has never been anything other than a myth. I hope that, and there's several others in fact, that we could look at, uh, goosebumps, uh, the muscle right here in your arm uh, that when you move your, your thumb across and it moves and so forth, it uh, allows you to grasp things. Uh, these are all called vestigial organs, but when you, when you look at their function, you go, no, that's nothing left over from evolution. God put it in there for a purpose. And if, it's, if I didn't have it, I would be very much uh, at a loss.